Welcome to this afternoon's panel, uh, Coalition Interoperability. Our moderator today is uh, Captain Retired Ron Gumbert, and he'll introduce the panel and uh, take it from here. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, attending this afternoon. Uh, today's panel is the first in a series of discussions on coalition interoperability that will be held over the next months and years as we work to improve the, our ability to interoperate and communicate across all levels, whether it's military, uh, contractors, academia, and other government agencies working with our partners throughout the AOR. At the end of this presentation, we'll, we, will, we will discuss a session that will be held in April in order to continue the discussion on interoperability. Uh, and that will be hosted by uh, Indio PACOM headquarters uh, here in, in Hawaii. Uh, as Admiral Richardson said uh, at the lunch presentation, free and open Indio Pacific uh, is essential for us to conduct our operations, uh, whether it is humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, uh, protection of economic zones, protection against piracy, or any of the levels of military conflict that may occur. Today we have a panel that is composed of four individuals who will have different perspectives on the challenges of interoperability uh, in the Pacific AOR. First is uh, Captain Alan Edmondston, the Deputy CIO and Chief of the, Strategic, of the Strategy Integration Resources Requirements Division J68. Uh, he recently served as CEO of U Naval, U.S. Naval Communications and Telecommunications Station, Bahrain. Next, we have Mark Fox, who is a senior manager, Global Defense Programs, Amazon Web Services. He's currently responsible for strategy, sales support, and business development and relationships with global defense agencies and partners. Mark was a surface warfare officer. Next, we have Frank Quick, the Director of Defense Security Cooperation Initiatives at MITRE. In his, in his role, he is responsible for security cooperative initiatives spanning defense and intelligence matters worldwide. Frank is a retired commander in the Navy, also a SWO. And at the far end of the panel, we have Lieutenant Colonel Van Tai, Air Force Mobility Instructor Pilot and Foreign Affairs Officer specializing in Northeast Asia. He is currently assigned to the Asia Pacific Center for Strategic Studies. We had hoped for this panel that we would have one coalition partner that would be able to be with us. Uh, regrettably, that did not work out. But when we have the next session uh, in April, we will include that as, as a panel member. I will now ask Captain Edmonston to my left to provide a short introduction and initial comments uh, and then he will, at following the introduction of all panelists, he will then provide a scene setter for us to do, understand exactly what we're looking at uh, in the coalition interoperability field. Captain Edmondson. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as we start talking about interoperability, um, we have to look at the Indo-Pacific uh, as a, an entire region and understand the fact that we have to be able to operate in a collaborative fashion to be able to secure that free and open uh, environment that we're looking for. In order to do that, we need to be able to communicate. And so the first thing I would do is I would challenge you is to think about what is interoperability. It is, it's more than just simply exchanging emails back and forth with a partner. It is the ability to operate and integrate our capabilities so that one, we can leverage each other's strengths, and two, that we do not create seams that an adversary can exploit. The second thing is, is that we don't know the partners that we're necessarily going to, to embark any particular uh, endeavor on. And so we need systems that are capable of leveraging infrastructure that is already in place. We cannot purpose build something for every single challenge that presents us. We need to be able to reuse it, and it needs to be able to pass the types of signals that we need so that we can actually integrate. Uh, lastly, 
I would challenge that the, the way we've looked at things in the past where we draw these artificial lines in the world that are based on the way that we organize as the United States uh, Department of Defense causes frustration for our partners. Um, they don't view the world uh, the same way that we do, and they cross these boundaries all the time. And when they do so, they do not need the systems to change, the procedures to change, and the methodologies that we go about sharing information to change every time they do that. When a unit gets underway from Europe and it makes its way across through the CENTCOM AOR into the Indo-Pacific area of responsibility, they need a common set of tools, tactics, techniques, and procedures as they do so. So as we embark on these couple of questions, hopefully it'll be a dialogue and we're able to kind of point us in the direction of the things and the challenges where we need to focus on. Uh, I ask you keep those things in mind. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Mark? So uh, I'll follow up here as uh, the industry commercial representative as opposed to just someone up here from Amazon today. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to the captain's words here, which was that necessity for infrastructure globally. And obviously we're talking about a specific AOR here. And that is the one thing that the commercial industry from a cloud perspective, uh, which is very likely to be a key enabler, a component of anything that we have to do from a coalition interoperability standpoint. That infrastructure today from Amazon, our competitors, our peers that serve the Department of Defense is already in place. I can talk specifically to Amazon and the answers are very similar for the other companies that play in this space is the infrastructure is already in place on our west coast. It is in place in Japan. It is in place in Singapore. It is in place in Australia, and, and we and others will continue to expand that infrastructure. Those are investments that we make, that the community here does not have to make, that is here for them to leverage. Um, that infrastructure and those capabilities that are provided from the commercial standpoint is not just the cloud, the data centers. If you would look at that as the center of the bullseye, it's a relatively small part of it. The bigger piece of it, if you walk out into the conference room or into the, uh, the, the showroom floor, all of these other companies that operate in this cloud ecosystem now that can bring to bear their technologies to be able to enable this coalition interoperability that is the panacea that we're trying to go to. So Amazon, the cloud itself is not the panacea. It is an enabling capability to be able to allow us to do the things that are necessary to have this coalition interoperability. Mark, thanks very much. Frank? Yes, yeah, so um, my previous job at MITRE, I've been at MITRE about 25 years now, um, I was responsible for all of the combatant commands and the defense intelligence work uh, worldwide that MITRE has, around 300 staff years worth of work. Um, and I was asked to move over to the security cooperation and coalition interoperability just about the same time that um, uh, Secretary Mattis put out his priorities, which is number two, as you know, is... Uh, uh, more and better partners, more capable partners. Um, and one of the things that uh, MITRE has put me uh, as a responsibility is to move the ball forward across the Department of Defense. That's what the FFRDC has been tasked with uh, by the Department of Defense. And that actually goes beyond <coughs> DOD when you think of it that way, right? So if, if we think about as we move into coalition interoperability in the Indo-Pacific region, things like that, as uh, the Admiral said earlier today, we're always gonna do things with partners. Uh, that has a, a, uh, several specific benefits to both the US and the partner nations. Uh, one, uh, when our coalition interoperability is understood to be strong, and it means that they're actually uh, an adversary would have to go against a combined force that is very capable because of the interoperability, maybe the, the conflict doesn't happen in the first place and we don't lose any lives on either side, which is you know, the best standard to use. But the, the subtlety with that is when there is a humanitarian crisis in any one of these countries, their militaries are their biggest uh, asset to come in and help the people. And the U.S. is many times brought in to help as well. The faster that we are interoperable with the partner nations, 
the more human lives that can be saved. So from a industry and a uh, academia sense, there's a real humanitarian component uh, to interoperability that we can't uh, forget. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ty. Yes, sir, uh, I want to focus on uh, what the uh, captain said on communication, all right? That's the key to interoperability, and that's the reason, you know, Daniel K. Inouye founded the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. It's one of our of five regional centers of excellence in that our mission, uh, a little bit confused with a research center, a think tank, a university, we kind of do a little bit of each, but we're a DOD entity that brings security practitioners at all levels in the Indo-Pacific uh, AOR here to discuss, to talk, to address their concerns uh, in the AOR. And then that's where we get to understand, to know their problems their outreach, all right, and find out how we can help them. We're not forcing anything on to them. We're communicating with them, the soft power touch, engaging, and see where we can come uh, and partner with them, reach out to industry, to other agencies within the whole of government approach to help with this interoperability. So that's what our center does uh, in that aspect of building, you know, U.S. presence in the area of responsibility. Colonel, thanks very much. So why is, why is this panel here and why are you here? Uh, and the answer is we are eliciting from you ideas, thoughts, uh, innovative approaches to solve the problem of coalition interoperability. Uh, we want to leverage what you know. We want to repurpose what we've already done. We want to innovate uh, to identify new technologies that will allow us to leap ahead of where we are today, right? We don't wanna just get better at what we're doing. We wanna look at how we can improve going into the future. So we are looking at establishing an ongoing dialogue between PACOM, between industry, between acad academia, and between our, our industry and coalition, uh, pardon me, state government, pardon me, government, other government agency organizations to help us understand what, ch what the challenges are to help us determine what initiatives we can undertake and how we can move ahead. So what we will be doing is we'll be asking a number of questions here of the panel in order for them to discuss their viewpoint about what their views are. But we also ask that you think, have we got the right question? Are we approaching this properly? And at the end, we will put up a, a note that will uh, indicate uh, to whom you can text your questions uh, that will be posted uh, at, certainly on the uh, TechNet Pacific site, the FCA site, uh, at the end of the conference. So with that said, what I'd like to do is start with some questions for the panel. Uh, and I'd like to stock, start with Lieutenant Colonel Tai. Colonel, what do you think is the most significant coalition interoperability challenge or opportunity in the Indo-Pacific Indo AOR? Well, as you all know, the Indo-Pacific, it's vast, all right? There's a lot of culture, a lot of folks here, a lot of people on that. So it comes with a lot of security challenges, just like the indo pacom commander said, for maritime security, the cyber security on that. But all in all, I think the countries, the leadership of the Indo-Pacific, they want to develop their economy. Everything is tied in just like this example of how Hawaii, all right, uh, wanted to protect, you know, the electric grid, all that. that. That's part of it. The bottom line is going to be how they want to develop their economies, their countries on that. So uh, the challenges are going to be there to threaten that piece. And then the opportunities are how we can partner up with them, as I mentioned, to find out, you know, be it fisheries, uh, from illegal fishing to maritime security, where we're developing, you know, or giving them uh, patrol boats, but also developing some ISR capabilities to help them, you know, secure their EEZs. At the same time, for the oceanic countries, all right, a lot of it is tourism. They're out there. They want to make sure their air domain is secure. So how we can work with them to protect, work with industry to protect uh, their trade, okay, of tourism when it comes on. So th there is a lot of uh, threats out there, but together, all right, we can work to address those threats and then 
uh, help those countries develop their capacity. Thank you, sir. And uh, Frank, if I could ask you to weigh in on that from your observations of what you have seen in, uh, in your long yeah. experience in this area. Yeah, so um, there are a couple of things, uh, you know, as, I, as we were saying before when we were talking, that there are real opportunities in this area. And, you know, as I said in my opening talk about the humanitarian assistance part, um, Usually when I say that, uh, people say, yeah, but when we're doing a, a conflict and we have to protect the information, that's even harder. Um, and while that is true, um, that is not something that's foreign to industry. Uh, industry partners with competitors all the time, and they don't open up their entire systems. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mark pointed out is uh, that Amazon and Microsoft uh, collaborated on creating Alexa and Cortana. I am certain they didn't open up all of the secrets that are in Amazon and all of the secrets that are in Microsoft to do that. That, it, that absolutely is a coalition network that they created. Why is it harder for the DOD to do that? It shouldn't be. And getting um, new ideas on how to do that, because as uh, the captain said earlier when we were talking, it isn't sharing or information protection, it's both. And Certainly the uh, industry, when they're protecting their intellectual property, they absolutely focus on both information sharing and security, and we can too. And Mark, if you could pick up on that from the uh, industry point of view. Yeah, it's the, the Colonel's comments around uh, everybody in the AOR having some involvement in this is important. I mean, we expressed our soft frustrations that it's, we don't have membership right. here. Um, one of the things, again, back to what the industry can do, and I'll speak specifically to our piece of it, is this whole evolution of what we now call cloud computing um, has flattened the world in terms of a country's ability to create and deliver solutions that they couldn't have done a number of years ago. So pick any of the smaller number of nations that are in the AOR who have access to this significant amount of compute and storage capacity, A, to use as they see fit, but probably the bigger opportunity for them, and I deal with this a lot on the NATO side because, you know, trying to convince 29 members to do any one thing is very difficult, and it's probably similar here, but all of them have that access. So if someone in Vietnam, right, wants to create something that in the past, in, you know, five, ten years ago, they just didn't have the infrastructure and the tools and the capability to do that beyond what they could host themselves, that's gone now. They can go to any of the large commercial cloud providers, and they have access to the same set of tools that the largest companies and countries in the world have access to. So in that case, this ability to involve and engage all the members of the coalition, it got flat. No one has any significant advantage over, one, over another anymore as it relates to from an industry standpoint. Thank you, sir. And uh, Captain, if you would respond uh, from a military perspective, uh, specifically the, either the opportunities or challenges you have seen in implementing some of these solutions. Yeah, I think what, uh, what Colonel Tai alluded to is that we have a lot of nations out there with national interests and national policies that kind of predicate how they want to operate with, with their partners. And for a long time, I think we've taken technology and we've looked at what's available and we've tried to shove it into the policies of the countries that, that exist out there and then we bolt things on. We take uh, a fairly light and nimble system and then we throw it into a safe and then we strap a security device on it and then we make it so you can't see it and then we cover it up and all this kind of stuff and at the end of the day it doesn't do the, the mission that it was supposed to do because we bolted on all these different uh, things. I think that uh, technology and innovation have actually brought us to a point now that we can go back to the basic requirements of the, of the partners, national policies and um, organizational policies, figure out what we're trying to achieve, and then from there apply the technology, apply innovation to actually deliver a solution that fits the policy and that we don't have to change policy. So instead of the policy fixing technology, let the policy lead technology, and let the folks in this room innovate and develop those systems 
that can purpose meet uh, the requirements of the different various partners that are out there. All right, sir, and, and could you say, uh, could you help the audience by perhaps giving a couple of examples where you have seen this work, right? We're trying to get our audience energized to be able to say, how can we help address these problems? Do you have examples uh, that you can mention of, of where we have brought innovative ideas into the way we're doing business? Yeah, the, there's a lot of things that are out there, and I, and I don't want to, you know, damper, dampen the, the innovative thought by saying that, that these are, are the end of innovation. There's probably out in the audience an idea that we haven't thought about in applying to the problem set that's, that's at hand. But we have taken, for example, uh, the need to secure U.S. national uh, information by using cryptography. And in the past, we've gone with NSA-approved uh, type one encryptors, very expensive. We come up with uh, agreements with our partner nations to be able to come up with a coalition releasable version of that crypto device and we sell it to them. Uh, this takes a lot of time. They're purpose-built for the, the mission at hand. And where we've come in the last uh, decade is we've come up with a way to take commercial cryptography, commercial solutions for classified, uh, build that and adapt it so that we can now bring in a partner where we might not have a ComSec uh, agreement with, but still provide that protection of the information to that partner. Uh, we've also come up with methods to be able to individually encrypt data so that the, the data itself it is not protected within the system, but it is protected on its own self. So these are just some of the ideas uh, of how we do that. Um, within the Indopaycom AOR, we're trying to reuse physical infrastructure so that you can have a, a computer terminal and one day it's meeting your US only specific requirement and literally, by the movement of a mouse, you now have access to a coalition network without changing any of the physical infrastructure. And so we want this both at the command post all the way down to the tactical level. So Mark, can you talk about, too, about how some of those ideas have been implemented by industry, which is really ahead of the DOD in this area? Yeah, I, I would say as opposed to some ideas, and I may throw a couple out here, I, I think a lot of it goes back to uh, you know, the different motivations which will drive a different process for industry to adopt. Um, and, and the captain alluded to it without saying it, but what you're saying is work from the customer backwards, right? That's the way that our world operates. So as, as all of us that are in here, and again, the drive is to pull this group and many others into the future events around this coalition interoperability challenge, is to really fully define up front what is the need, what is the customer demand, what are they asking for, and that we collectively as a group work backwards from there. So I think that this is an opportunity for us over the course of the next year to really look at the process that we go through to come up with some capabilities that eventually go through a JCTD or some other fashion to eventually deliver capability to the warfighter. Um, I, I can talk about some tools that we and others have in our bag, whether that's, uh, again, there's collaboration tools that we use internally there are teams that have, in essence, what is sort of a, a more modern version of, think of a shared drive, that I have access to today with 10 other people. Uh, if, if I'm the administrator of that tomorrow, I can revoke two or three people. I can see <coughs> what they did when they were in, what they were out. Um, so these are, again, our, our work collaboration tools. I think the other thing that could be looked upon here um, are tools that provide virtual infrastructure in, in virtual workspaces or desktops that are in the cloud. Again, we've been doing VDI uh, for a number of years in DOD and it's really starting to catch on so that when I go out, whether it's an HADR situation, um, I, I really don't need to have anything with me other than connectivity. And I'll leave the kind of final note there is around connectivity. Whatever is needed to be done in the coalition, if there is no connectivity, all these things that I can allude to or industry partners can allude to, if I can't get to it, I don't have it, it's, it's useless. So I think that's an area that we're gonna to need to focus on. Uh, we in industry continue to expand. It is uh, an Achilles heel and a dependency that we have as cloud providers. If you can't connect to us today, if your device doesn't have connectivity and all these apps that are running on here that are hosted in the cloud, they're useless. Um, so I'll look at what we're seeing as an industry trend now uh, is to look at more ways to connect. 
and, and one is an example that I threw out in the industry partners here, and I need to go speak to them, is with Iridium. And Amazon Web Services has announced that they have an upcoming satellite constellation that shy of traditional Wi-Fi in a hotel or at home, we now can go out into a true AOR at the edge and have connectivity. So whether it's Amazon or anybody else, without connectivity, all these things in the cloud from a commercial standpoint are not going to work. So I think that needs to be part of what we look at going forward is making sure that we've got connectivity, that we've got it everywhere, and that it has enough bandwidth to handle these situations when they arise. And if we protect the data at the data level, then we also reduce the overhead that we have with the firewalls and other systems that are impeding our ability to get to these cloud Correct. solutions. Correct. It's, it, it's you've got to protect the data down at the data element. Yeah. Uh, and it knows, can Ron see it? Yes. Yeah. Can Mark see it? No. As opposed to we're both either blocked or let in at right. the exterior. Right. Frank, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, kind of uh, taking with uh, what both the captain and Mark just said, um, the wording that has come out of DOD about specifically about coalition interoperability right now is about enhancing, integrating, and uh, modernizing systems with partner nations um, for mission success. And, you know, as a computer scientist, I love focusing on the first part of that sentence, but the last part of the sentence is probably the most critical, right, for mission success, because we can get system A to talk to system B, and if it's not used for mission success, we've wasted time and money that can be going to actually moving the mission uh, ahead. Uh, one of the examples that I would use um, uh, as a success uh, for interoperability isn't in the Indo-PACOM theater just because many of the systems and the successes in this theater, everybody in this room already knows about and, and we have opinions one way or another, but um, the system, the, the set of systems that I would use is uh, EPI in, the, in Europe, which is the European Partner Intelligence Enterprise. Um, and what that was is they had um, a need to do surveillance uh, of Russian activities, uh, but it turned out most of the ISR assets were being used in the Middle East. So they had to figure out how could they do this. So um, they put together a coalition and uh, made it so that uh, they kept the uh, information unclassified as long as possible. So you were using an Italian MQ-9 over Poland, analyzed by Danish and Belgium analysts. Um, and if you did that in a traditional means, the number of times that you had to declassify and reclassify that data would have made it unworkable. So finding a way to do it within the system so that the data is both protected and we can do uh, collaboration is a good example of a way to uh, work the systems and figure that out. That's why I think for a lot of this stuff, you know, as, as Marcus said, you know, that this isn't rocket science in, in a lot of these cases, right? So um, uh, his, his point about Iridium, uh, when we were talking earlier and I brought up the, the uh, point about humanitarian assistance in a, a situation like um, uh, the tsunami or a typhoon or something like that, you know, Mark's point is, is that, well, the Wi-Fi is probably not working, right? So how do you do that? Well, connecting to satellite communications would be a way to do that. Again, thinking about the problem and what is the mission that you're trying to solve and focusing on that, and that goes back to the captain's point of don't come up with a system first, then figure out how to make it secure or make it uh, shareable with partner nations. Let's focus on the mission. The mission, as the Admiral stated, is always going to be coalition. So focus on coalition mission success and then build the system around that. Lieutenant Colonel Tai, uh, how about some thoughts about that, I would say from a more academic or coalition view that is non-US military? Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't mention but uh, one of the uh, biggest challenges in the uh, world right now, but also in the Indo-Pacific is uh, a lack of trust, uh, maybe credibility of the United States. Are we there? Uh, are we going to sustain our engagements, be it from uh, withdrawn from the TPP, be it with the verbiage in NATO? So some of the allies that come here, the partner countries, uh, the fellows, they always kind of bring it up. They want us uh, to, to reinforce our efforts, something sustainable, all right, on that. And we continue to do that. Uh, so the, the mixed messaging strategically, okay, is 
is there. It's, it's ambiguous. But at the same time, on the second and third tier level, be it Secretary of Defense, be it our Admiral, like Davidson, also uh, Richards, and then the generals out there kind of reinforcing in the country, I think we need to continue to do that. But also, what kind of makes us a little different from the other countries, maybe the Belt Road Initiative, some of the other stuff, is that, yeah, their governments are forcing the aid out there, maybe putting it out, but it's not sustainable where, as you all know, the private sector in the United States, that's what the U.S. government does well. We push our private sector out there, all right? And then as our industry gets out there, builds those tides, you know, with the country to help them build their security capacity, it's long, it's sustainable, and it creates jobs with us and with them on that too. So the, that's how we work some of the tr trust issues. An example, maybe uh, I'll, I'll look at Japan. Uh, about eight years ago, we're looking at, you know, and then there's a lot of countries I think we touch on from uh, Five Eyes to down the chain. We have to get over some of our concrete mindset about information sharing. Now, I'm not saying that we need to uh, sacrifice any uh, integrity within our system, but we got to look at it where it brings value and the cooperation with the, the Japanese, you know, on their missile defense has gone a long way. As we open up the doors from uh, General Fields to General Angelola, UF, uh, USFK, uh, J commanders out there to see where we can work with them, integrate with them for the common defense and benefit of both Japan and the United States on there, be it to the war gaming exercises when they come over here to work in the 613 uh, AOC, all right, and also the Patriot guys on there. So just breaking some of the, the boundaries to ensure that we have the strategic ob objective and even like the purchase of the THAAD as we push the THAAD in uh, South Korea and in Japan. I mean, there, there's benefits of that. We just got to think outside of the box still. Thank you. And I, as I hear that uh, discussion, it, it brings to mind the risk management framework, right, as we moved away from DICAP and DITSCAP, and this is now about managing risk, not eliminating risk. And we have to do that in our coalition relationships as well as our information sharing. Frank, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that particular thought? Yeah, that's, that's the thing that um, <clears throat> each one of the um, combatant commands uh, deals with that in a different way. And, um, I think it was either uh, you, Ron, or uh, the captain was saying that that can frustrate our um, allied partners uh, because, you know, when they're dealing with the Army in Europe, dealing with the Army in the Pacific is not necessarily the same. Um, so there are some partners that work with us in both places. Um, but the, the other thing with that is, is that um, there are uh, components to... Uh, the security apparatus that uh, we can break down and, and make it so that it is implementable uh, across the board uh, so that uh, we can solve it once and not have to keep redoing it. Um, Mr. Cislak has, has tried that on several occasions uh, through the years. And um, the other part about that with the risk is that, you know, we've, we've talked uh, many times, and one of the things I was talking to Mark about last night is that the commanders really want a way so that they can dial the risk in because they understand that you can never have zero risk. But when a, when a mission success is important enough, when you're going after somebody like a, an Osama bin Laden on that night of the raid, you might accept a level of risk of 10. If it's somebody that is just somebody you wanna get, the level of risk you might accept is way lower than that. So finding a way through technology to be able to understand and what's happening right now is many times the combatant commanders are accepting a level of risk that is not completely well understood by any of us. Um, how much risk are we putting into the system by um, say uh, allowing a partner nation to connect and to have access to a certain amount of data where they may not be a partner a week from now or two weeks from now. The commander stepped up and said, I need to get this mission done, I'm accepting this level of risk, but I don't think we're giving the commander enough information to understand how much risk is going to be um, basically uh, kind of enduring uh, beyond the, uh, the cycle of the mission that we're trying to get done right now. 
So Mark, if you look at that from a commercial point of view, right, you're dealing with this all the time with your customers, be they financial services institutions. Uh, how does industry address this really challenging problem? So one, one of the problems that we have is the multiple uh, programs around uh, this whole concept of risk, whether it's RMF, FedRAMP in our world here, uh, if it's PCI DSS in the commercial financial services world, SOC, HIPAA, et cetera. Uh, if you were to throw them on the table, which is what we effectively have to do in industry, and create a Venn diagram, there is probably 90% overlap. So A, there's too many programs. B, they don't leverage and look at each other. If I go and I sit down with a, a leadership person within the military, and they don't have, so let's say it's another country over in Europe, which will often happen. It's, it's, it's Groundhog Day every day again. I go over there and I meet with another country with their MOD or DOD. Their first question is, tell me what DOD is doing. Um, so I'll go through a drawn-out story from about 2010, sort of when the cloud world started in, in commercial world and in, in DOD out to today. And I'll tell them that you're at about 2012, and you can continue down your path, and in, and in six years from now, 2018 and 2024, you're going to be where USDOD is today. Uh, and it has the intended effect, which is, okay, what can I do different? How can I shrink that timeline down from six years to two years? And, and a lot of it will get into, should I create my own FedRAMP, which then evolved into our world in DOD to FedRAMP Plus and the, the security requirements guide? And my answer in most cases is don't. Try to adopt what have become commercial best practices, which is likely going to be uh, security compliance regimes like SOC 1, 2, 3, or have them look at PCI DSS. I mean, the most probably sensitive thing that we have out there as consumers is our credit card information, our buying habits, where we live, all those things. Um, those security controls are, in many cases, significantly stronger than what we have even within FedRAMP today. So, so that's just one general comment that I think we need to look at in this context if we're start, starting from a clean sheet of music. The other part of it within this risk management framework equation is I don't think that we have waited, and you alluded to it a little bit there, Frank, the component of speed and agility. If I can do something so fast and move around within these commercial environments that an adversary can't find me, and by the time he does find me, if he ever does, my mission is accomplished. I can accept an extremely high level of perceived risk. And I don't think that's really in our equation today, um, you know, as the secur security and compliance community and the DOD is taking a look at what they can or can't do with these commercial technologies. Captain, if I can go to you and say, are there some initiatives that PACOM has underway or is looking at ways to address these kinds of issues from a military point of view today? Well, I think the, uh, the other panel members uh, have hit on a really important point that at the end of the day what we're trying to do is enable our leaders to be able to make the most informed decisions to, be, to get that risk informed uh, decisions that's out there and one of the things you need to be able to do when you make those decisions is to understand the environment in which it's being made in and so I think that one of the most important things that uh, we need to achieve is to get that situational awareness down to a way where a commander can look at what's going on in the information transfer in the cyber domain and understand how is that tied to the physical infrastructure that's out there, the virtual infrastructure out there, the mission threads that run through it, and which partners it ties into. And without that visibility into what's going on, you can't make those informed decisions about risk. So when a, um, an adversary overruns a, um, a router, routing facility or a fiber gets cut or a data center is lost, what are those threads that run through that and understanding how that happens? And, and a lot of this stuff right now is automatically rerouted and re uh, rehome to different things. Um, we need a tool that can actually show that and that the commander can look up at something that's easy to digest at time now and figure out what that risk is to the mission so they can make those informed decisions. And so that cyber situational tool that delivers that 
is the thing that we really need. And that's what uh, I know we've been sending the demand signal for that capability, but that is what we're working on to actually to deliver to the warfighter. And that uh, creates some very interesting uh, thoughts about how well we are able to reroute or, or re-divert the information so we maintain that situational awareness uh, no matter what happens. Uh, some, some very rapidly changing things, I think of the wildfires we've had here on the West Coast uh, over the past uh, a couple of years. Uh, you see how dynamic even a non-military situation can be, how it can destroy the infrastructure you need in order to operate, and then how do you get information whenever those normal lines of communication are not in place? Or how do you do that if you have a coalition partner that does not have normal kinds of communications with you if you need them in order to support the fight? So, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tran, if I can, uh, pardon me, Ty, if I could, uh, can you talk about uh, some initiatives that, that you see being worked on in the Center for Strategic Studies uh, as you try and look, look for ways to bring in our coalition partners and solve problems that they might have? Yes, sir. Um, I mean, overall in academia, um, for, for our institution, we bring in the, the practitioners, but I like to kind of throw it out for academia because just like uh, in the engineering side, uh, I mean, there's a, a ton of bright young minds out there, all right? Uh, they're not confined, they're not constrained kind of by our organization rules, just some, some in the cyber domain where you're red gaming, war gaming, you're recruiting on that, you're looking at that, they, they have the time, the energy to kind of innovate, kind of think outside the box of the critical <laughs> issues and vulnerabilities. So I'll just push on to continue that where they're in an environment where they can test, fail, recuperate and move on uh, to, to push on to that. So from our center's point of view, uh, when we bring folks in, we just kind of address, we give them the overall picture, at least how the U.S. government sees it. We get their input on if we're right, we're wrong, and to, to share how we can better the, the situation. And from there, we take that back, we step it back, and then, as I said, we're a DOD institution, and how we can reformulate, help reformulate or the messaging or the uh, strategy in a sense that we can better help our folks. And messaging is key too, because uh, right now there's the ASEAN uh, uh, forum going on and uh, the, uh, the Japanese, they've reshaped, okay? It's not Indo, a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, all right? So they know their audience, they're focused on that, they're, visioning, they're changing it to a vision, okay? So the connotation is there for the outreach to help get more partners on board. So that's what some of the institutions are doing is how can we shape this to make sure there's no, uh, there is not a bad connotation and find a win-win situation with our partners and allies, sir. And uh, Mark, if I can, from an industry perspective, I know one of the challenges we have in DOD is attracting and retaining uh, the, that talent, right? Those skills, uh, bringing people into federal service, whether it's government or civilian, uh, so that we can retain and help grow those skills within government. Uh, can you talk about some of the things you're doing in industry that helps attract and retain those kinds of people? Yeah, that's, Ron, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's kind of a softball one, and, and I was laughing with somebody about this a few weeks ago. It, you know, up until recently, we and a lot of the other companies, again, would have similar programs to where, you know, we try to hire a lot of folks coming off of active duty. You know, Amazon's made a commitment to hire some tens of thousands. I think Jeff's commitment was 50,000 um, veterans and spouses over the next 10 years, and we're well on our way to, to meeting those goals, as, as a lot of our other partners are doing. Um, we have programs for the .edu world to try to get these people in their college programs involved and engaged in these tools so that then they can take the skill set for those that would like to do so to support you know, the aerospace defense community to come in and help out with things like this. Uh, but we're now seeing that movement from industry outreach down to the elementary school level. It, it's gotten to that point to where the drive and the need to get talent, our demand signal, uh, is so big. Um, but that education or those educational programs that we and others are putting forth only a small percentage of them will actually, at the end of the day, in some cases, flash forward 10 years, um, are they gonna come to work for an Amazon? 
Um, we, we are doing what we can do from industry to educate them on our tool sets so that they, in many cases, will leave and go to work in a dot mill community. And hopefully they'll be using our tool sets, which in turn will be good for us from a business perspective. But, you know, the, the funny part aside, I said I think we're going after people now in the STEM community that are literally in diapers. And, and, and it sounds funny, but it's not far <coughs> removed from getting these children exposed to it. So I do think that we're going to see a pool going forward that will actually expand. We're in a transitionary period now where you've got folks that are going to have to make decisions. Am I going to learn these new skill sets, be it cloud computing or others? Um, or am I going to just be done in a number of years and move on? Uh, I, I do feel optimistic that the pipeline, um, again, coming up from the elementary school through high school through college now is expanding significantly because this is becoming the norm. If they want to get into the technology space, they're going to have to become comfortable with you know, cloud computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, IoT, all those things that are, in essence, many ways, the buzzword du jour but it is the future of, of where their, their lives are going to be. And it'll play and help out what we're doing here. Yeah, I think there are a couple things related to that. Uh, uh, our younger children are learning how to use technology such that it is ubiquitous, right? It's not something they have to learn. It's something they do. So not intimidated by it. Uh, not intimidated by exactly. And then you also see that we have wonderful programs like the STEM program. Uh, all the support that uh, industry has given, government has given uh, to help in increase the, the skill levels of our young folks so that when they become of age, they're ready to join the workforce and, and deliver the kind of capabilities we're looking for. Frank, you have some comments there? Yeah, that um, when, when Mark was talking about that, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard this. Uh, they talk about the difference between digital immigrants and digital natives, right? We're all digital immigrants because it didn't exist when we were that age, right? <laughs> well, when you're brought up and it's just part of what you do, you behave differently and you think differently about it. Um, and that gets to the other thing that we talked about, you know, trying to predict the next thing. And, and I think that's a mistake to do that. Um, you know, we've almost never been right at predicting the next thing, right? Uh, the Model T, um, beyond the fact that when Henry Ford was asked, you know, if he asked his customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right? But the real reason that he thought he was doing was it was a public service thing because it was fighting pollution in the cities because there was so much horse excrement in the cities that the Model T didn't do that. So it was, it was fighting a, a real problem that they were facing. Um, the other thing was is when they asked um, uh, Von Braun about the V1 rocket that you know he was so passionate about building and then was so horrified at what the Nazis did with it. And they said, you know, well, what do you think went wrong? He said, well, the only thing that went wrong is it hit the wrong planet, you know, because he built it to be a rocket. Um, so I think trying to predict what the game changer is, is, is a mistake. And I think uh, capitalizing on, uh, you know, where the future is going, um, because, you know, as, as you were saying, uh, Mark, about uh, technology and, uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Cislack was talking about a, uh, a few years ago was trying to make the AOC wherever the commander is at that moment because we can't just bring them off of a plane somewhere in the Pacific and bring them back to Honolulu to get to the AOC. Well, what has he got with them and can we make that into the AOC? Um, that is true with technology that we have around today. 10 or 15 years ago, that wasn't true. Um, so... I think capitalizing on the changes and embracing the changes and not trying to predict it, or as the captain was saying earlier, you know, don't try to take this and then make it into a type one encryption device because that's the way we know that it works. Figure it out how, what is the mission and how do we get to uh, mission success with what we have. So, Captain, are there some things that uh, PACOM is actually, pardon me, Indo-PACOM is actually looking at today uh, that is designed either to bring in the younger generation or solve problems in an innovative way uh, within your organization? Well, I think that um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, instead of focusing on the Band-Aid uh, for a problem that exists out there, and getting people to think about, you know, how do you make uh, the bleeding stop? Rather than that, is to trying to go back to the actual root requirement. What are we trying to do? And let the 
innovators in the world take a look at the problem in its in its root and apply their you know um, their ingenuity to that and develop solutions that, that we couldn't think about. So uh, I think our challenge is instead of trying to get a PC to do something that a PC just can't do, um, figure out what it is that we actually want a PC to do. All right? Go back down to the information that we want to be shared with our, uh, our partners and then present that problem to the, the new generation and say, okay, if you have this need to be able to get a targeting data to a weapon, today we, we package it up, it becomes a range and bearing or a latitude and longitude, and we put it all together with a name and a bunch of descriptors to it, and we send it off in a little computerized system, and, and that's how it goes. But is that really what we need? All we need is for the... Um, the weapon system to know how to hit the target, all right? And so is there a better way to do that? Can we just send raw information? Do we have to package that all up together? Um, we need the ability to know the difference between a friend and a foe. Um, do we need to actually have a tag placed on the signal to say this one's the friend, this one's the foe? Or can we make the, the system smart enough to identify what a foe looks like and what a friend looks like and determine that ad hoc uh, on every single, every single target that it tries to acquire. I think that we're, we've been trying to put Band-Aids on ways that we saw the problem was 20, 30 years ago, instead of just going back down to the basic requirement and saying, what are we trying to do? And then what is the innovative way to achieve that? Which creates some interesting challenges because I think one of the hardest things we change in DOD is policies, uh, right? So how do we adapt those policies that give us the flexibility to inject this new technologies that might help us really solve some of the problems? So one of my challenges I'm gonna throw out to the audience is don't be bound by policies. Just because we don't say something, just because we say something today is against policy, don't take that as an absolute. Challenge it, challenge us so that we work together be able to take advantage of these capabilities and just saying, oh no, we can't do that. So Lieutenant Colonel Ty. Sir. Can you think of some long-term or basic research efforts that might complement the ability of Indo-PACOM to address some of the challenges that are laying out there for coalition interoperability? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and with, with our courses, you know, uh, we're starting a new maritime security course. We do advanced security cooperation, but uh, we're always bringing the partners because each region in the Indo-Pacific uh, is unique, as you all know, and they have different challenges, all right, from water security to the maritime piece to uh, terrorism on that. And even, uh, you know, the term terrorism, it's kind of hard to define. You throw it out there, everybody's going to define it in a different way, just like interoperability, you know. Everybody's going to define it in their own way on that. So uh, we continue just to uh, reach out to work, to bring in different points of view, sir, to, uh, to address those security concerns. Uh, even as you mentioned, you know, we're looking at Southeast Asia, cybersecurity. A lot of those countries, uh, besides Singapore, Singapore, you know, has a lot of capabilities there, but those other countries are developing, all right? But we're not waiting for them, all right? And you all shouldn't be either, for them to develop that capability. We're gonna help them develop together to ensure, you know, that it's developed in the right way, secure way, especially since we have two treaty allies in that uh, area of the AOR on that. So we're trying to continue to get their input to the lead turn and find the breakdown, the barriers of cooperation. An example would be Malaysia. They have uh, some rule sets that they can't work directly with uh, their, uh, not their military, but their other agencies, uh, government agencies, can't work directly with some of our militaries. And what I meant by that is there, we have state partnership programs. Each state is partnered with certain countries, be it in Asia, be it in uh, Africa, Europe, to help build their capacities, trying to show our uh, soldier, scholar, civilian, military piece of the house there. But I had a fellow come in and he's working through to break that barrier so they can have uh, easier cooperation, direct cooperation, 
uh, with their FEMA and some of our military guard folks directly on that. So we're, we're trying to help them break those barriers, sir. That's excellent. Uh, Frank, can you make some comments about things you've seen, uh, I'll say, around the world? Yeah, so um, the other thing that uh, we're doing, uh, similar to what uh, the Colonel was just talking about, is uh, capitalizing on uh, the, the good work that the U.S. Department of State is doing with these other countries, and then working through the J-5s to look at the security cooperation plans that the J-5 have for these countries, because they're not necessarily in uh, opposition to each other. Right? So there are many times when the um, uh, security cooperation plans that the J-5 have where they need a country to have a specific type of capability and the humanitarian assistance uh, money that Department of State is doing with those countries, many times uh, that uh, bleeds into uh, cyber preparations and things like that. Well, all we have to do is work with both sides uh, in that case, the DOD and the Department of State to actually make a real difference in the capability of the country in a way that actually helps the security cooperation plan of the J-5, which would then, you know, gets into the six and the three as well. Mark, if I ask a question then that uh, may be, take us a little bit off, off focus there, but uh, is there a way that um, industry is, is cooperating, working with, the DOD and with our coalition partners in other countries to try and get an understanding of what they want to do or what they need to do as opposed to what's just driven by market uh, activity? Uh, they, they go hand in hand. I think it goes back to my initial statement, which is sort of how business is run generally in commercial, and it's sort of a, it's, it's pounded into our head day in and day out is it, is it is about the customer and the working backwards part of it. Um, U.S. DOD, although we're still very early days on in, in adopting these commercial cloud technologies and others, we're still way beyond most of the other countries that are in this area and around the world. Um, you know, the, the, the things that we're doing is, A, to, to just do that, to go have the meetings, ask the question, um, and then work backwards from there. And I, I would go to specifically to this piece to throw out a couple of ideas to kind of steer off a little bit directly from the question and to go down another area, which is the challenges that are here. I think we understand, have a pretty good understanding of what is the challenge here, just generally speaking around the coalition interoperability piece. And that challenge needs to be thrown out as it has here today. This is sort of the first shot across the bow. There's gonna be follow-ups in the springtime and, and, and maybe future down the road for that is we need to think about what is the process. And again, we from industry can help say this is how we would go about it, right? And, and the process for us, it's something that anybody that's sort of read up on Amazon specifically, is this construct around what we call two pizza teams. You take a challenge, in this case it's a customer requirement for coalition interoperability and probably some more specifics than that, and you put together a team of people that is very diverse. In our world, it's gonna have representatives from security, it's gonna have representatives from various different technologies that we have. And that two pizza terminology is that group cannot be any bigger than it typically takes two pizzas to feed them. If it gets bigger than that, you've lost your span of control. They're not gonna be able to go fast. It doesn't mean that you can't have, and we will do it. I did not understand it at first, that we will take one challenge, one customer requirement, and we will build two teams, separate them. They don't even talk to each other in many cases. Many cases, they don't even know the other exists, and both of them trying to solve the same challenge. I think that there's an opportunity here for us to take this challenge, bring together the folks that have an interest in being involved in this, build diverse teams, segregate them off and let them each come up with their own ideas because they'll be able to go fast, it's a group of eight, 10, 12 people each, and then let those ideas be brought back. So you'll have multiple members of industry in there, members from security, from government, from education, across the board, and again, that's the way that I know we would do it internal from an Amazon perspective and a lot of other folks in commercial would do that. Uh, and then once you're locked down on that solution, again, you stay with that construct of a very small, very agile team to take it forward, whether that goes into an exercise or it turns into a solution at the end of the day. But you know, if we have too many in the group, as we all know from experience, we're gonna have a challenge making decisions and this is not gonna happen fast enough. So if we're able to leverage those lessons learned from industry, uh, and again, I'm sure that ourselves and others will raise their hand to help out, not so much with the technology, those things are there, they're gonna be a part of it, but what are the processes? 
you know, how do big companies like an Amazon, how do we uh, deliver innovative solutions fast? And then the last piece of this that, you know, Ben, you brought up was long-term. You asked him a question about long-term vision. Um, the definition of long-term is in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, let's think about that. You know, long-term for us, people go, what's your long-term plan, Mark? What's two years, five years out? The answer is it really doesn't exist. Long-term for a commercial company, in many cases like us, is six months to maybe two years. There, there is nothing written within the organization that says, here is our five-year, 10-year, 20-year plan. Because things are gonna change, they are driven by the customer, and we need to be small, fast, and agile and make those quick moves to be able to deliver those capabilities, or we're out of business. Excellent, thank you. Uh, can I ask the folks in the back if you can put up the slide that uh, uh, asks for questions, tells you how to text, text it in? Uh, and then what I'm gonna do, that leaves directly into, thanks Mark, uh, what I'd like Captain Ed Edmiston to do is talk a little bit about the challenge that we're gonna have uh, in April of 2019. Uh, if, as he is talking through that, if you have any questions that you would like to submit, please submit to the, or text to that uh, site or uh, email, uh, and uh, Captain, if you would, let's, if you could talk about uh, what you see the uh, event coming up in April being about. Yeah, as if you recall at the very beginning, uh, Ron mentioned the fact that this is a beginning of a series of meetings that we're going to be having to be able to talk about the challenges that are in front of us and to find opportunities to be able to advance interoperability with our partners. So in April of 2019, we'll be hosting a coalition interoperability forum. And this forum is going to be an opportunity for us to take the items that we've talked about today. Hopefully you'll have had an opportunity to think about uh, some of the things that we've talked about. You'll be able to go and check what industry is capable of uh, potentially delivering and you'll be able to bring that back to us and we'll be able to see how we can work with not just the industry partners but also our mission partners to deliver warfighting capability that will enable us to pass the information that we need to to drive toward that mission success. Uh, there are a lot of things that uh, we didn't uh, get to specifically uh, as challenges, but uh, we did talk about the, the uh, dispersed island nature of this AOR that requires us to be able to communicate even when the terrestrial connectivity paths may not be there. We've talked about regional diversities where we have multiple languages that are spoken throughout the AOR. We need IT systems that can uh, translate and pass that information. We've got uh, mission command systems that operate passing different types of information but need to be able to share and collaborate. Um, we need uh, a way to identify our, our partners, uh, some sort of identity management framework that can work with the host nation uh, system but then to take a partner nation's systems and to be able to validate and, and assert some level of trust for that. And that has to be able to happen at the speed at which partners come and go from a particular, uh, from a particular challenge. So um, yeah, we have uh, some of the information up there on the board, so the, the dates are there. Uh, we're gonna, there's a website link at the very last line. So if you're interested in going, please visit the, uh, the website, get additional information, and there's an email address uh, about four lines down. Uh, let us know if you're interested in participating, and we'll keep you informed and get you added to the uh, uh, mailings and distribution as we uh, kind of uh, refine how this forum is going to work out. Now, ideally, uh, as with this panel where we had academia, industry, military, uh, group together. It would be wonderful if you could uh, pull together some friends, some colleagues uh, from across, whether it could be uh, you know non-DOD government, to help look at the problem and figure out what it is that you might do as a small team. Uh, there'll be more details, as uh, the captain said, on the website that explains what the uh, what the effort will be. 
uh, more information about the uh, session that will be held in April. Uh, and the, any questions you have will be addressed there, as well as additional information as more details are finalized. But we also understand that coming out to Hawaii does take some preparation on your part. So we will be looking ahead to that, ensuring that we get that information out to you. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, send those questions in so that we can uh, make sure that we have been clear with what the guidelines are going to be for this challenge. Uh, this really is about coalition interoperability. It is about the ability to communicate, uh, as the good Admiral said uh, at, at lunch today, to be able to talk to one another, to be able to understand, and communications is more than just talking and hearing, uh, making sure that we understand what the mission requirements are. If we don't clearly identify what those requirements are, we'll go solve the wrong problem. And we don't have enough time to solve the wrong, wrong problem. So we're looking for your great thoughts, for your initiatives, uh, anything you can think of to help, uh, help PACOM address this challenge that's in front of them and help us uh, become better uh, war fighters and uh, better representatives of the United States government in this AOR. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I, I think that uh, we do appreciate everybody's presence here this afternoon. May I ask for a round of applause for the panel who is with us today. All right, we thank you very much and wish you a great afternoon.